This is a reprise of a lecture that was given in the second year of the computer science course at the University of Hull to brief students about using sockets for network programming in C Sharp to enable them to do their coursework. This is intended for students who may have missed the lecture and wish to catch up. So here's the introductory slide. It's about programming C Sharp sockets uh, using the library system net sockets. So what we're going to look at is client and server networking. And, and here we have a uh, computer representing uh, the server and the data that it's storing is that it's connected to the network and it serves that over the network to various clients so the computers that run a client program to request various data from the server so we program this using in C sharp the socket library which calls some methods the first thing we have to do is declare if we want a client we use the type tcp client and we create a client by saying new TCP client like we would any other object. So that's a client object. We can connect this TCP client to a remote computer by calling the connect method and we pass it a string which contains the name of the computer we want to connect to and the second parameter is the port number we want to connect to. So that creates a so what we call a socket that connects the local host to the named host and port on the remote computer. And this pair of the IP address and the port number, the IP number and the TCP port number, is called the IP endpoint. And that shows the endpoint of the connection. So the easiest way to explain how this all works is actually to show a program. So here's a little demonstration program that more or less works. So we're using the system library, using system net sockets and using system IO. We can create a class uh, for an application called Whois. And this is a console application and this is the main program. And it takes an array of arguments. And here we have the declaration of the new TCP client and we can connect it to a server. Now this is connected to a Whois server, which is a protocol that works over port 43. And then we can create a stream writer to handle the stream. So from the client we can get the stream, do a stream writer and a stream reader to that stream. Once we've got a stream writer we can use our ordinary write line just like we write it to the console and we'll write some data to the remote server. And what we do is we read its response back. And once we've got the whole response we write it to the console. And that's a very simple client. And that shows how uh, programming works and you can try that in the laboratory. If we move on to servers, the server is at the other end that's listening and that's actually declared by using the object TCP listener. We can create a listener of that object type which is by doing new TCP listener. But what we do say is the port that it's supposed to listen to. And once we've created one we have to tell it to start. So that's starting on the port. Right, so now we've got a server listening. Now the very simplest way to run a server is what's called single threading, in which the server opens a socket, it sits and waits for a message, the listening, and once it's received a message from the client it processes that message and then it sits there and waits for more input. And every time it gets some input it sits and processes it. And this is what we called event driven processing because the in and the input is queued in order now this is sufficient to do our coursework but it's not really sufficient to be fully professional but we can show briefly how that works because it's easier to understand so here's a little piece of example code doing a server socket now we've missed out all the using in the main program we're going to focus on this main body here of the code that runs the server so here we declare a TCP listener, as it says, and we've 
and we make a socket decoration for the one connection that's made because we don't have a connection until somebody talks to it. So we put a tri catch round it in case it breaks and if it does break we can log that exception. So here we've got a new listener on port 43 and we go around a loop forever because the server works forever and it sits there and waits until it accepts a socket. And that's our connection. So once we've got a connection we can extract from that our network stream that's uh, bound to the connection and then we can just handle whatever request was made of the server and once we've handled the request of the server we can close those sockets and connections go back and wait for another one and we keep going round and round forever just handling the request one at a time as it showed in that slide Let's look at multiple threads. Multiple threads is uh, how people would expect servers to work in more professionally is that they can handle several requests at the same time. There's no queue backlog. It allows the servers to be responsive. When you connect to it, it doesn't say, wait, there's another response request coming in. Your, your request is independent of other people's requests. And to do that, you have to use threading and that's implemented in C-sharp with the system threading class and the runnable interface. Now we're not going to talk a lot about this in this lecture course which is mainly about the networking but it is something that you need to understand and you can research in your own time. So here is the single threaded model. There's a queue of requests from different clients and it processes one and sends the output and it can't process another one until it's processed the earlier one. In multi-threaded we've got basically clones of the process and these are the threads that process the input and so because they're clones each one of them can be handling a different input request and they can be handling that concurrently and that's how a server can talk to many clients simultaneously using the concept of threading. Now once we've got threading we've got many things that can be running and each one of them has a state diagram and this is the state diagram of a thread. So a thread is created and it starts and it's usually ready to receive some work. It receives some work and it might be running but then something might happen that doesn't get all its input, it's blocked from running and when it's unblocked it can be ready to run or it's running and it's finished and it's stopped or it could be running and uh, it can't carry on it's suspended waiting until it can be ready to run again or it could be running and waiting for something and then it can be ready to run again so there's a life cycle for threads look. now let's look at the coding for writing threads in C sharp so here's some example code here and it's using the system and from the system it's using the system threading class library and underneath here we've got our code for our who is server and in there we've got a run server method and that will then call the do request method like it did before and the main program starts by calling the run server method that's what we had before in a single threaded one but now in run server if we want to do the re handle the requests concurrently we can create a new thread call it t and we say that thread contains a copy of the do request code here and we start that thread running with t.start which initiates a concurrent version of the do request and then it can immediately go up and then perhaps make another thread with another do request in it so we can have many of these running at the same time. So code is quite simple for threading something like a concurrent versions of do request. There's also another way of coding threads it's called lambda expressions and they're more or less anonymous threads that don't have a name and uh, much like the previous example in our run server method we could just say we want a new thread 
and, and here's a parenthesis for starting the thread and then we could say this thread contains do request which we want to start immediately so this is just saying call do request and start it right now and we didn't need to declare a named thread and we can uh, if do request has parameters we can put them in there when calling it so it's a way of passing parameters to our threads so there is quite some quite simple coding mechanisms for starting threads there's obviously a lot more detail in the textbooks um, that were recommended for your programming 101 module now once you start concurrency there's a few issues you need to know about you can have multiple processes in there they can have different priorities some can run higher and lower we don't normally alter them but it's worth knowing they can have different priorities and they can also communicate with each other and within um, threads within C sharp there are mechanisms that the different threads can communicate and that maps onto the state diagram that we showed earlier so threads can be entered, entered, exit, they can be told to wait, they can be woken up and that's within an object called monitor. The other issue when you've got multiple threads is a concept called deadlock. Sometimes deadlock is very hard to understand um, but I find the concept of how you buy and sell something on the internet is a good example of deadlock. So if I want to buy something on the internet on a website like Craigslist or Gumtree or eBay or something I've got the money um, but I think the person who's trying to sell to me perhaps is a fraud and, and so I, I refuse to give him the money or the person until I get the item. But equally the seller is bona fide and he doesn't believe that you're a valid buyer and he thinks you're cheat them so doesn't want to send you the item till they've got the money so if nobody will give way we've got a deadlock so that's a deadlock situation the same thing can happen with threads that they won't exchange information until they get some information and the two threads will be deadlocked now in the assessed coursework you're asked to implement a client and server solution using a database on port 43 but this is not shown in the videos. So that's a brief resume of the introductory lectures. I hope you found that useful.